Good morning. Glad you all are here. This morning's lesson is entitled, Claiming Christ as Lord. The text comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, in which Paul says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Rather brief statement. A lot of things impact in that. But Peter informs us that Jesus is Lord, having been exalted to God's right hand, according to Acts 2 and verse 33, according to Scripture. But he's also the Christ. He's the anointed one, according to Acts 2 and verse 37. He's the Lamb of God who takes away sins. John standing with his disciples as Jesus came walking past, said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So the fact is, is that's who Jesus is. He serves in a number of different capacities, but they all harmonize together. And it makes him something more than what just a lot of people think he is. And it is, such a, and it, and it is in such a way that you can't take part of him without taking the rest. He's not a smorgasbord. He's not a, um, a salad bar where you can pick and choose what you want. You take all of it or you take none of it. I haven't heard it for years, but there used to be people that would say, give me the man and not the plant. You know, I just want Jesus. I don't want the rest of it. Well, you can't do that. Not biblically speaking. You can try it, but you'll be wrong in doing so. So as his followers, we have to go to Jesus for direction. In John 15, 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, the question is, is are you a friend of Jesus? And we've got a hymn, I'll be a friend of Jesus. But the thing is, if you don't do what he says to do, you can call yourself anything. But the very least is you won't be a friend of Jesus because a friend of Jesus does what he commands. Well, we don't have to do all that stuff. Well, I, I, don't, I can't tell you about that. I can tell you what it is we are supposed to do. The fact is, he says very plainly, if you do whatsoever I command you. That's a condition of friendship with Jesus. Now, Again, I'm not sure what, other, what a lot of folks think about that, but there it is nonetheless. But we also go to him for protection. Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. So the fact is, we come to Jesus for rest. Uh, Paul talks about the wrath of God that abideth on the shoulders, of the, the, that abideth on those that, that are disobedient to his will. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he talks about those that are going to suffer the consequence, eternal damnation, that know not the Lord and uh, that know not the Lord and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there again, there's that idea of obedience. That that if we're going to hear Him say, "Come unto the rest prepared," it'll be because we've done those things that He's commanded us to do. Now, just simple obedience doesn't obey us. It has to be from the heart. The form of doctrine delivered, Romans chapter six. But we are to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. Paul says, For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That means we preach all of it. Instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm not allowed to leave anything out. Now, again, you tailor your message to your audience. What do those folks need? Or at least what do you believe or understand or think? A particular group of people needs or an individual person needs that's what you do and sometimes you have to start from the very beginning but you know we can't leave anything out and part of that is that he is deity he is God himself he is part of the Godhead he is not God the Father he's God the Son John, John chapter 1 and verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God Jesus was God he was with him but he was also part of him. Part, he was part of the essence of the Godhead. I, I guess the best illustration I've come up with, and I'm not saying it's a good one, it's just all I can do, is if you have a, a sheet, a blanket of some sort covering on this table right here, and you reach over and grab a handful over to here, and you grab a handful of it over there, you got two separate handfuls of the same sheet, of the same thing. You don't have two different distinct things. You've got two handfuls of the same thing. So you've got three beings of the Godhead. They are of the same essence. God happens to be God the Father, and there happens to be God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit, but they're all one and the same. Jesus and John 8 and verse 58 says, Before Abraham was, I am. 
And the Jews tried to stone him because he was claiming to be God. And he was correct. They were wrong. They understood his claim. They didn't accept it. They rejected it, obviously, because they're fixing to stone him. How can a man be God? Well, indeed. And I've been asked that before. And my thinking is, is well, God created it all. I'm sure he can pretty much do whatever he wants to do in harmony with his will. But I also say I don't care just as long as he's done it. That's the, that's the bottom line. It's also interesting that he was a part of God's scheme of redemption, if not the focal point. Ephesians 1, Paul says, according as, in keeping with, in harmony with, he, as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. There is a plan for us to be in Jesus, and all those that are in Jesus he would choose, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So the fact is, is that for us to be in him, we have to be holy and without blame before him in love. That's the condition for being in Jesus. Peter says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. And again, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. I think that's crucial, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now there are folks today that say that Jesus dying on the cross was not the original plan. It wasn't plan A. It was, in fact, plan B, according to them. They say, well, Jesus came to establish his kingdom. But the Jews, I don't know how that worked out, but the Jews kept him from doing it because they nailed him to the cross. Well, if they did it the first time, what's to keep him from doing it the second time? Well, he'll be from the heaven. Okay, he was from heaven the first time. He said, I came down from the Father. That's being in heaven. So, no, the scriptures plainly say it's, a, it's plan A. Plan A was the thing. That's what happened. Exactly what happened. What happened is exactly what scripture said was going to happen. So that Jesus was part of the scheme of redemption. It's also interesting to note that he now reigns at, the right, at God's right hand. Now, there are those that say, well, he's reigning in prospect. They say he's going to come again. We discussed it briefly in Bible class this morning. They say he's going to come again. He's going to establish his millennial reign for a thousand years in the literal city of Jerusalem on the literal throne of David for a literal thousand years. Well, in a word, no. He's now reigning. He's not reigning in prospect. He's reigning in fact. In Acts chapter 2, verse 33, beginning, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he hath himself, he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, do all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now that's, that's not in prospect, that's in fact. That's the thing that happened at the appointed time. Hebrews 1 and verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory, an express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Again in chapter 10 and verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He's reigning. He is now reigning over his established kingdom. And again, we can make the case that have in times past. can do it again if necessary. That, that the kingdom was established at the appropriate time, the appropriate manner, and the appropriate place by the right people, according to scriptures. But also should preach that salvation is only in the blood-bought body of Christ. There are no Christians outside the body of Christ. Everyone that is a Christian is in the body of Christ. Now, they might be apostate Christians. And they may have been marked and disfellowshipped according to the scriptures, but that doesn't kick them out of the church. Nobody has the power to kick anybody out of the church. I, I've said this before. I'd rather have an apostate sitting back there on a the back bench than be someplace else. 
Well, why is that? Well, because he's going to hear the truth, at least a portion of it. He may not like it, probably won't, which would surprise me he's sitting there in the first place, but that's another issue. He may just be a glutton for punishment. I don't know. But Acts 2 and verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So where did Jesus put the saved? He put him in the church. Did he put the saved anywhere else? Well, no. It's an exclusive statement. He put the saved in the church. Which church? The one that he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, that he promised to build, Matthew 16, 18, prophesied by the, by the, by the prophets, Isaiah chapter 2, and I think it's Micah chapter 5. So it's a matter of prophecy. The time and the place also. I preached on that quite a bit in times past. In the second place, in regards to claiming Christ as Lord, our field of endeavor is the world. Jesus said, All power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. And he told the apostles just literally moments before he ascended into heaven, And ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So where do we go to preach the gospel? Well, pretty much anywhere that you get access to. There's some fake place that won't let you in. Russia, China. Well, they do, but you can't say, I'm here to preach the gospel, and they won't let you in. But nonetheless, that's our job anywhere in the world. Well, but specifically, our spouse, first of all. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 12 through 17, is admonishing the Christian women, that, you know, don't, don't, Get rid of your husband just because he's not a Christian. How do you know that he won't be sanctified because of, what, because of you? Uh, and women have a lot of influence in that area. Now they got one, one, one fellow said, ladies, he's your head, just don't marry an empty one. There you go. And our children, for, uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 6. Some of, the greatest, some of the people we have the greatest influence with are, are our children. Our children learn how to be a man and a woman by watching their parents be a man and a woman. Our children, our sons learn how to treat women by how we treat their mother. Our daughters learn the kind of man to marry or not to marry by watching their dad. So parents are important. And they're crucial to, uh, to the development of a child. Now, I, I grant you there's single parents you know, for whatever reason or another, but, but, you know, you do the best. That's not the ideal situation, but you do your best you can. It's our own household, our own, our own family, to, to whatever extent that may, that may, in fact, extend. Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay. Wait a minute, he's the prince of peace. Well, he said, I didn't come to bring it. But rather division, for, for, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, Three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So there's going to be disruption because the gospel has been believed and is trying to be taught. We had a lady, one of the sisters in the congregation in Paintsville, Kentucky, that her husband was not a member of the church. I don't think John was anything. But in their younger years, when the, all the children were still young, one winter he literally went out and, you know, it, up in Bear Holler where they lived. Man, they, Dina, you've probably been in places just like that. You can't get there from here. I mean, you, and it's, whew, it's way out and gone, man. I mean, it's, it's so far back up in there you think you got lost getting there. And my elder said, no, Gene, just a little bit further. All right. So, that John went out and poured water on the tires of the car and froze it to the ground so they couldn't drive away. Her name was Willa Dean, too, as a matter of fact. She was, sure enough, sure enough. So, Willa Dean gets the kids, four or five of them, and they're trucking down Bear Holler. And John realized they were gone. He went after them and took them to services. Bless his heart. So, you know, you never know. You just never know what's, what's going to happen and how things are going to turn out. But our own household. Maybe in our own congregation. Acts chapter 20, verse 30. Paul told the Ephesian elders that there would be some among you men that are going to rise up and 
try to pull away disciples. Uh, Third John 9, Diotrephes. You know, we've got people in the congregation that may well not be Christians. They claim to be. They will have gone through the process, but are they Christians? And did they really obey from the heart the form of doctrine? Well, I just did it to get her off my back. I did it to cut, stop my mom from giving me a hard time. I've, I've had both of that. I've heard both of those stories. So, you know, that's the case. But our duty is to preach the word. Again, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. When they want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. Uh, Brother Carr told us at school, said, fellas, there's, you know, what, what you do when you don't know what else to do? When things are going well, you preach the gospel. When things aren't going well, you preach the gospel. When you don't know what else to do, you preach the gospel. That's all you got. That's all you have. And when people tell you, we don't want to hear that, then that's your, that'll be your moving sermon. Just have the U-Haul packed for that sermon. Um, and I tell you, I've never, well, maybe twice, but not in, a, in what I took to be a serious way. I've never had the, a, the congregation come to me and say, don't preach on this anymore. And I don't know if I said it to y'all when I first interviewed here, but I, I've, it's my, it was always my practice to tell a, tell a men's business meeting, if you ever tell me not to preach on something, tell me why. If you say, well, we just don't want to hear it anymore. That's next Sunday morning, by the way. Now, if they say, well, we're, we've got a situation, we're trying to get it calm, we've just about got it taken care of, and we don't want anybody to stir the waters, that's good enough for me. I, that's, that's appropriate. Or we want you to preach a lesson. We want you to preach on this particular topic. Okay? So. But our trust is in the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, Paul says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. A lot of things that happen to us daily ought to teach us that we are not all of that. Some things you can't stop. I don't care what it is. You can't stop it. It's going to happen. Natural disasters. You know, the storms that come through. I, you, you can't stop a tornado. Don't even try. I just tell you, it won't work. Pandemics, real or man-made, you know, everybody's going to get COVID eventually. You're just going to get it. Just, it's just going to happen. Uh, do your best. Wash your hands and all that kind of stuff. Death, you can't stop death, you know. Um, had people say, I don't want to die. Well, I understand. I understand. Not much you can do about it. Just, I mean, just really, it's one of the most frustrating things in the world. Now, since there's only so much we can do about any of this stuff, we ought to learn to turn to prayer for God's blessings before we start. In 2 Thessalonians 3.1, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Why would the apostle ask brethren to pray for him if it wasn't effective and didn't do something? That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Why well, pray for somebody that's sick? I mean, I, I, I never want anybody to stop praying for my wife. At all. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't believe in miracles today. But I, I just tell you, extraordinary circumstances sometimes happen. Uh, you know, and I, I'll take it. <laughs> the do, if the doctor, uh, I forget his name now, the cancer uh, oncologist said, I'm, we can't find anything. Good job. <laughs> I would have taken it. I would have taken it in a heartbeat. But what are you going to do? Just pray for strength and courage to see through to the end. That's all you can do. Because I don't, I don't, if somebody's got an answer to that one, I'd be glad to hear it. But pray before we, you know, when, again, when you know, when you don't know what else to do, pray about it. If there's somebody that's driving you crazy, write their name down on a piece of paper and put them at the top of your prayer. By the way, since we're talking about that, if you don't know what to pray for, 3rd page of the bulletin. I've even gone so far as to print it out for you. I mean, there it is. And <laughs> strike out the names you don't want to pray for. Shame on you. Let us know. We'll put your name on top of our prayer list. Literally pray for those people. I've, I've seen men get up in the pulpit. And Lord, we want to ask thy blessings upon and read the list. I've heard other people be critical of that. I'm thinking... If I've got one, I'm not going to play if Gary gets up with one, okay? 
So I, I have no problem with that. I, by the way, if my name's on there, I want you to make sure it's right. I want you to get it on there if it's not, it's that kind of thing. So I, I covet prayers. That's, that's fine with me. Important things to remember about all this. God is on his throne. You know, as Father said, when you're hip deep in alligators, it's hard to remember your job is to drain the swamp. God is on his throne. God is on his throne, and he knows what's going on in your life. Just like, you know, when you're, when you're children, they wanted something special for Christmas or their birthday or a present or whatever's coming up. And daddy, I'd like to have or mama, I'd like to have. So you know what they wanted and you wanted them to ask you for it. You know, you, you wanted them to ask you for it. And, and the all, almighty father is no different. Psalms 11 verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. As noted, he sees all. That should be Proverbs 15 and verse 3. Proverbs 15 and verse 3 and not verse 31. His eyes are in every place beholding the good and the evil. So, what's that tell you about how you ought to behave? Ezekiel was given a vision. He was taken in the spirit down to Jerusalem from captivity in Babylon to see some of the elders in Jerusalem back in a secret chamber, worshiping their pagan deities, saying that God is not going to see us because we're in this closed in room and it's dark outside anyways. And the angel took Ezekiel to see that. Now, how did he know to do that? Well, God told him, how did God know to tell the angel to go there? Because God saw it and took Ezekiel to see it. So I'm just saying that God knows what's going on in your life but ask him about it anyway. And by the way, when the situation is resolved, thank him. Be thankful. It's always nice when the kids come to me, Mom, I really appreciated the socks you got me for Christmas. Okay? I appreciate the gift. I thank you very much. It was just exactly what I wanted, whatever it is you choose to say. He wants us to call upon him. Psalms 145, verse... Uh, Verses 17 through 19. He says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. And then verse 20 says, The Lord preserveth all them that love him. But all the wicked will he destroy. Now that doesn't mean if you go to God and ask him for a Mercedes Benz because your, your friends all drive Porsches. No. This person is asking God because he's a righteous person in his own right, following the will of God. And he's asking for the things that God has authorized him to ask for. So he's not asking for off the wall things. He's simply asking for the blessings of God that God has to give. And then finally... This life, the time of it, and the strife in it is short at best. Again, again, when you're in that swamp and you're surrounded by alligators, yeah, time just kind of drags a little bit there. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul says, For our light affliction, now this is a man that's been shipwrecked and beaten a number of different times and stoned at least once that we have record of. He said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you wake up on the other side, and the angels are carrying your spirit to the bosom of Abraham, do you really think you're going to be upset by anything that's happened here? I'm going to be breathing a sigh of relief. I won't have any breath to complain about anything. I'll be glad to be where I am. Almost said something else going to break me down, but I won't. Give me a minute. <laughs> Man. Psalms chapter 90. The writer says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, 
Yet is our strength and labor sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. That's where I think that's, that song has its beginning is right there in Psalms chapter 90, verse 9 and 10. The fact is, don't care how long you live, you're still, unless Jesus stays his return long enough, you're going to pass away. And your spirit's going to go to the other side. And depending on how you've lived your life here, or at least according to the rich man and Lazarus, you will open up your eyes in one of two places, and only one of two, and you will open up your eyes, and it will be in only one of two places. It'll either be in torments, or it'll be in the bosom of Abraham. There's no third possibility, and there's no escape. Claiming Christ as Lord means we submit the totality of our lives to his control. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And if he's done that for me, how hard is it, how difficult is it for me to give my life for him? And to simply agree to his terms for salvation and obey those terms by his grace. Because he didn't have to tell us. But he's told us, the grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared on all mankind, teaching us that denying a godliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Well, if living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, by God's grace, gains me an entrance into heaven, brother, we can do that. Because it's only going to be for a brief period of time, relatively speaking, a brief period of time anyways. I think I can handle that. So what about you? What is your desire? And this is, I think, really, when it's all said and done, it just breaks down to what do you want to do? What's your desire in all of this? Is your fond expectation a home in heaven? If it is, then it has to be based on, what, on how you've responded to the invitation of Christ in this life. And we're all free moral agents. We can pick and choose any course of action at any time we choose. You, you chose to be here this morning, in spite of ill health and fat, you know, just not feeling well. You're still here. And sometimes being here and singing and praying helps. I had a friend of mine. He preached for the church down in Dade County. Um, can't think of the name of it. Danny Morse was his name. There's a brother had cancer, sat on that into that pew right there. Well, down there, you know, that... Hollywood, Hollywood Hills. And somebody said, and you could see him fading away. They said, brother, what are you, why are you here? He said, I can feel bad. <laughs> he said, I can feel bad at home or I can feel bad here, but I'm still going to feel bad. Here I'm with the brethren. And, you, you know, you got to admit that when you sing, I remember Gene, Gene was saying one time that he said, you know, I come here and I can't breathe. I walk out and I can breathe. Because when you sing, you're breathing. I mean, you're, you're breathing, and it helps your breathing, and it does. So there you go. And just think that as much as that man suffered, as much as my wife suffered, as much as, you know, Brother Cook suffered, Pete suffered, they're not suffering now. That's a good thing to keep in mind, and James and all the rest of them. James probably misses his tractor. <laughs> just going to say. I don't know. That's just one of those things I think about. So what about you? If you passed away this moment, where do you think you'd spend? If you don't know, let's talk about it. If you're pretty sure, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. But the thing is, is whatever, whichever way you go on that, we can confirm it by what the scriptures teach. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, from my perspective, I'm interested in the salvation part. I'm not interested in the damnation part. I want the salvation thing. So I'm going to do whatever Jesus says to do to gain the promise he's given me by his grace. Because nobody deserves it. Jerry asked me, so, well, am I good enough? Well, honey, nobody's good enough. Nobody's good enough to go to heaven. If anybody gets there, it'll be by God's grace in the first place. So, what have you done? What are you willing to do? That's the question. If you've not obeyed the gospel, do so. If you have, but you've been unfaithful, come back. If we've said something that may give you a question, let's sit down and talk about it and we get some answers. If you need our prayers, we'll be glad to pray for you. But you have to let us know by coming down front and specifically telling us what your spiritual needs are. While together we stand and sing, we have a meditation.